I'm a feminist, but I saw a poster for a film called Fierce, the untamable Joan Crawford. And I thought, I want to be the untamable Deborah Francis White. <laughs> and I'm going to go further and say, I want men to try to tame me <laughs> so I can prove that I'm untamable. <laughs> That'd be a good reputation. I think so. Untamable. Yeah, yeah. Untamable. Yeah. yeah. Fierce. America's I'm next just top picturing like it's, it's lions, isn't it? They get tamed. There's like a hoop involved. <laughs> I was trying to think of what tools you would use to tame but, Joan uh, Crawford, <laughs> or indeed, that's uh, anyway. Why don't you? Why don't you do one? Chris? Yeah, I think I should. Yeah, crikey. I'm a feminist, but last week I shouted, "I paid for your food. You have to let me hold you at my cat." <laughs> And then immediately felt like I was not a feminist. Is your cat male or female? Oh, he's male, yeah. Do you know, I, was, I was trying to tame him. That's what I was trying to do. The bastard. I'm a feminist, but at the Guilty Feminist book launch party, David Baddiel came up to me and said, oh, I've got your book, but I haven't read it yet. And I said, oh, you don't have to. And he said, no, I want to. And I said, don't feel obliged. <laughs> At my own book launch party for a book with feminist in the title. Oh, no, David Baddiel, you keep singing about football coming home. There's no need, there's no need to read my little words. What's the fuck? What the fuck? I'm a feminist. But sometimes I let men in the music industry assume that I know nothing about guitars because I find talking about guitars relentlessly boring. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but tonight backstage, Grace Petrie looked at me and said, am I overdressed? And I went, no, no, you look great. She went... I think I might be overdressed. And I went, no, 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 I think you look great. And she went, I think I'm overdressed. And I looked down and went, I'm taking off my cardigan. <laughs> I'll look a lot more dressed up then. <laughs> I took her repeated <laughs> questions about whether she was overdressed and decided I was very, very underdressed. <laughs> I sit before you now feeling deeply underdressed. <laughs> but she hadn't seen with the cardigan on. She hadn't seen how sparkly this was. And I feel when that was revealed, she changed her mind. But if I'd had a change of costume backstage, I definitely would have done it. I just want to say, so I started in a suit, a three-piece suit. I know, I've downgraded a lot to smart cash. No, you're wearing yeah. the standard Gareth Southgate now. I... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. If you're listening at home... Gareth Southgate fucking ripped waistcoats off me. That's all I'm saying. I've been yeah, wearing waistcoats true. for like three years. I and admittedly, I think they predate that as well. Um, <laughs> I'm a feminist, but when my sister-in-law decided to take the last name Petrie, it made me feel like we were an advancing army and had conquered a country. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was a bad feeling. <laughs> I love that idea. I genuinely love that idea that the more women you can make Petri, mm. the more the Petri will be a big yeah. feminist army. Yeah, but yeah. we're losing my sister. My sister, not lo That's a bad thing to say. My sister's taking her husband's yeah, You're not losing her. No, She's I know. Just... That should have been my... I'm a feminist, but, isn't it? Yeah, no, no, no. You're not losing her. You're not losing her. She is... She's taking a man's name. I don't... I sometimes wish I'd taken Selinsky, though. I just never did it because I was just like, that's just someone else's name. It's really weird. It'd be like taking his trousers or something. And I could just like... Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. test stealing his car keys or something. I'm like, yeah. it's not my name. Like identity fraud. <laughs> kind yeah. of, yeah. Taking his credit card. I don't know. It just feels like that's not... I mean, I have done that. I just want to... I want to <laughs> populate the world with Petries, I think. Yeah, I know. I do understand. I just didn't take it because it just felt like not me. But I've sort of regretted it since because Selinsky's such a cool name. And he's five generations ago was Polish... And the women there, if he's Selinsky, they would be Selinska. So I've often lain awake at night thinking I could be Deborah Selinska. 
That is and cool. Then I'd be like a Bond, ba- yeah. a bad Bond girl. For sure, yeah. I'm a feminist, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's a Roger Moore era one, oh. I think. I mean, it wouldn't be Deborah, it would be Minge Selinska, but, you know... <laughs> still. Um... Live from Northern Stage in Newcastle, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Grace Petrie, and very special guest Sammy Dobson talking about jealousy. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, and today I'm joined by Grace Petrie to talk about jealousy. <laughs> I asked Grace if she'd co-host a show with me and she said, I'm not a comedian. And I said, I know, I'm really excited about that because I'm not going to lie, I've listened to Grace's album so many times and I just wanted her to play more songs from it for me live. (laughs) And I was like, I just want to hear them. Basically, what I think Grace is... No, do go on. (laughs) I think Grace is if Billy Bragg... Hannah Gadsby and Joni Mitchell were all one person. Oh, wow. I thought you were going to go down a thruple route. Uh, no. No love child. No. Okay. No. Just, There's no just love child. Just a hybrid. <laughs> with a really weird accent. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Not really. <laughs> I've been listening to your album and I've decided that my genre, and I didn't know this before I listened to it, but my genre is angry songs about social justice and sad songs about lesbian relationships not working out. <laughs> and I've got a lot of both. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much all I've, that's all I've got, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. But I'm glad I know the answer to that now when people are trying to market me in the music but, industry. Uh, and they're like, oh, it's, uh, is it folk? Is it punk? But I can be like, no, it's angry <laughs> songs about social justice and sad songs about lesbian relationships not working out. <laughs> There's loads of festivals for that, isn't there? <laughs> I'm going to start a label, and that's what it's going to be called. <laughs> you may be the only artist. No, actually. No, you should check out Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> you and Roxanne from Suffragette. Yes, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I really would like to start a Guilty Feminist music label. The Suffragette EP will be out soon. Um, oh. Those songs make me feel like ready for battle. Mm. And I feel like I love hip-hop, Grace, but there's not enough... Because a lot of women say to me, they, I'm a feminist, but is that they love hip hop. And they end up in the morning getting ready for war, you know, or work. Um, <laughs> going, the bitches and the hoes. And, the, and they're like, oh no, I shouldn't be saying this. Um, why am I saying it about bitches and hoes? But they feel really, that's not empowered. <laughs> they, feel, they, they, do, they feel, okay, and this is my theory. The penultimate chapter of my book is sort of like what I've called the dessert course, and it's all about why there's a hidden feminism in the things that we're drawn to that on the outside seem like a guilty pleasure. So I've written about things like rom-coms and weddings and BDSM. (laughs) And one of the things I've written about is hip-hop, and I think we're not imagining ourselves as the bitches and the hoes. We're feeling what it's like to be that guy who's so sure and so in charge... Of the bitches in the house. Well, okay, that part is not right. <laughs> but the, just the central feeling of like, yeah, I'm just like not apologising, you know, like... No, yeah, taking up space. Yeah, yeah sure, the swagger, sure. no, the I'm swagger. I mean, all the bitches in the house shelf should be... Content warning, we're going to talk about bitches in the house. <laughs> and little else so far. Please welcome to the stage, Deborah Francis White. <laughs> Have you ever experienced this? Your friend said that if they were going to be in your neighbourhood, they'd give you a text because they were going to have lunch, maybe, but maybe not. And you think, oh, maybe there's something will happen on Sunday and maybe it won't. And then you either saw on Facebook or found out from somebody they did have lunch, but somehow didn't text you. (laughs) That's not just an experience that's happened to me, right? Please. (laughs) I'm going to need from others to feel some, yeah, 
I get left out of stuff. Please, guys. <laughs> okay, I mean, if it's never happened to you, what ifs? <laughs> Bitches. Uh, so, if somebody is just heckled and hoes. <laughs> just give us a cheer if you thought and hoes, but held back. <laughs> including Grace Petrie. Whoever didn't, I love you. Have you ever lived with a man of any description? Could be a lover, a brother, <laughs> a father, anybody, who that would have happened to, or that has happened to, and they've just been like, oh, well, they probably forgot to text me. And you've thought, what do you mean they forgot? Because you've spent five days thinking about the fact that you got left out of that brunch-lunch situation. And you now, when you see those people next, are like, hi, yeah. And you're trying to work it into the conversation, all casual-like, like, did you have lunch? But secretly thinking, why do you hate me? Why have you left out? Were you there talking about me? And why would you even do that? And you're trying to casually bring it up, but not like you're neurotic or weird. And you're just like, just wondering if you ever did end up going to that brunch place and then just checking to see if they're going to go, no, we never went. Or, yeah, we texted you, but we didn't, uh, the text bounced because we were out of the range. <laughs> or I, Sam said that you already had gone for brunch that day and probably wouldn't want to come or some reasonable explanation. Now, I am in the camp of people that will need a reasonable explanation and will fret about this. My husband, I mean, I've often said it, my husband is probably a Black Mirror app. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence pointing in that direction. He'd just be like, I'm sure if they wanted me to be there, they'd ask. <laughs> but like, not hurt, just like fact, fact, fact. What? But why are you not upset by this and neurotic and concerned? And he's like, I'll see them another time. That's not the fucking point. The point is not, will you see them another time? The point is, why didn't they want to see you this time? He was like, oh, maybe they had something to discuss privately. <laughs> well, that's horrifying. <laughs> so my friend Fiona Thompson and I are writing a book called Super Tribe. And it's about the way people tribe, and it's about the way we connect. It's a sort of slightly Malcolm Gladwellian type paradigm for looking at the world. And um, somebody's just realized they've forgotten to ask someone to come to this show. <laughs> and they're like, shit, we said if we were going, we would call her. And we got the tickets and we never told her. She's probably at home crying because we tweeted that we were here and we Instagrammed. Look at us, the whole gang at the Guilty Feminist. Say feminism! If you're listening at home, someone's run out in a panic. So rather than looking at men are from Mars, women like shoes, um, which is not true. I, some women like shoes, some no men are from Mars. It's all nonsense. What we're looking at is traits and behaviors. And we've gone back to hunters and gatherers. On the savannah, more men were hunters than women, but it's, there's plenty of tribes where women hunted or men and women hunt together. And likewise with the gather. But overall, as a trend, men tended to hunt and women tended to gather. So there are all sorts of interesting things that you can look at. For example, fight and flight is more useful for hunters because hunters could often outrun something. Hunters tended to hunt in very small groups, gatherers tended to gather in large groups because gatherers could protect each other. Gatherers had less upper body strength and were too pregnant to run, which we were always too pregnant to run. We would stand together shoulder to shoulder and fight. And we know this because anthropologists have studied uninterrupted hunter-gatherer tribes that exist to the 20th century and some still exist to today. So we started to look at these trends. The hunter tends to have a clear metric for success in a hunt. Did you come back with a woolly mammoth or not? A hunt is a failure if you do not come back with a gazelle. End of story. You can't catch a quarter of a gazelle. Um, so it's a very clear metric for hunters. So if you come back from the hunt and you've got a gazelle and Jeff's a bit pissed off, hunt still a success. 
If you come back from the hunt, everyone had a wonderful time and everybody's happy. No gazelle, hunt, failure. <laughs> gatherers are different. Gatherers have a much longer economy because you can have a small gather and you can have a gather of kind of dodgy berries that are a bit dried out. And gatherers, because we have to fight shoulder to shoulder, need to look out for and look after each other. And if I'm in the third trimester of my pregnancy and my water's actually breaking, I need you to go and gather for me on the basis that I gathered for you before and will gather for you again. So it's very important for gatherers in a way that's not important for hunters to keep each other happy and check in with each other and go, are you happy uh, with me or are you going to leave me out of this gather? Are you going to say you're going to mind my baby, but really you're going to leave it in a ditch for a wolf to eat? <laughs> So gatherers need to be much, much better at reading each other than hunters who can fight or flee. And so gatherers have a habit of checking in with each other to make sure they're definitely in the gang. And this is the reason why Fiona and I have assessed through our research and uh, guesses. Um, <laughs> That's what Malcolm Gladwell does. Come on, he just doesn't say that to what he's doing. I'm a woman and a gatherer, so I need to. So if you have 30 gatherers and the hunters are off and some jackals are circling and there's 30 gatherers, and it's a low gather, so maybe there's only calories really for 28. It's not the worst strategy in the world to let one gatherer go to the jackals because otherwise they're going to get us all, right? So... Sometimes, you let one go to the jackals. Now, here's the thing. There's no time when the jackals are actually circling to have a meeting and decide who jackal bait is. You've always got to know who jackal bait is. And actually, anthropologists think that the main reason we learn to communicate is to gossip. So we could be like, Susan's not putting her money in the coffee jar. That's tr it's true. It's true. That's what they think. Now, when you were at school, if you remember girls at school or you were a girl at school, do you remember how there was always one girl on the out, but that changed, that position changed? So you never knew if it was going to be you or someone else. And sometimes you'd just find yourself on the out and other times you'd be in the center of the group, generally decided upon by one, two or three cool girls. And it feels terrible if suddenly everyone's not talking to you or they're talking about you. It feels like the worst thing in the world. And there's reason for that. If you're on the savanna and you are jackal bait, you probably have five minutes to live. <laughs> so when you're not invited to brunch, it can feel like you have five fucking minutes to live. You get the feeling of what? What? Now, the best way to make sure that you're not jackal bait is to be on the committee who decides who jackal bait is. <laughs> And that's why there's lots of that gossip of like, oh, she's like this, she's like this, oh, she's like that, oh, blah, blah, blah. And that can happen in any group of gatherers, and that could be a mixed gender group of gatherers. But as a trend at school, I remember boys standing around two boys going, fight, 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 fight. And one boy would punch the other boy, and the boy that was on the ground at the end lost. The boy that was standing up won. And then it was decided that boy was stronger than this boy. And I remember that happening. And I'm not saying there was no structural violence amongst boys. There probably was, and I'm sure there is. But I remember that happening. And I don't remember that happening with girls. I remember us deciding collectively who was in the in and who was on the out. To be honest, I wasn't really on the committee who decided who was out. But I remember that. And in smaller groups, I probably was. I probably was deciding, and there was gossip and discussion about those things. If you feel like jackal bait... There are ways of getting over that and getting around that. And I've talked to a lot of women who work in big firms about this during my research. And a lot of those women have said, at work, I am a hunter. I am process first and people second. And in my social life, I'm a gatherer. I'm like really worried about being left out. But at work, when I get the promotion or I get the big whatever it is, you know, I get the big account. I don't know, what do corporate people get? Accounts the Jenkins account. I got it. I've watched The Good Wife. Um, I've got the Jenkins account. And women have said to me in my research for this, they've said, it's the worst feeling in the world because I've done the hunt. I've got the gazelle. I'm standing there. And some guy will say something like, I don't deserve it or something snippy because he's jealous because he doesn't have the gazelle. And inside, 
I feel like a gatherer. Inside, I think, why doesn't he like me? All I did was try really hard. And I'm standing there with a big side of beef with blood all over me, but inside feeling like, please like my berries. <laughs> and this is fascinating to me. This is absolutely fascinating to me. And I feel like this very much. Always, wherever I go, I want to take my friends with me. If my career is doing well at any point, I want my friends around me. I mean, I've started a whole show called Women I Love Doing Well. Please applaud for the next woman I love. Look at her gazelle and her berries. Because I can think of, frankly, nothing worse. I want, I, you know, I want to be doing this that I'm doing, but it's quite exposing because I'm standing here in a light and I'm on Mock the Week now. And I'm like, my nightmare is to be standing there covered in blood next to a woolly mammoth on my own. Because then I've definitely got five minutes to live. Because I'm covered in blood and I'm holding protein. I'm like, where are my gatherers at? Where are my gatherers? Because we're going to hang together. Because we're going to, yeah, where's, don't go away, don't. So I absolutely fear this. It's sort of like the opposite of jealousy. It's like I desperately want other people around me to do well. And that feels like it's coming from a good place. But somewhere deep inside, I also know it's coming from a place of not wanting to be alone. So I have a thing, because I used to, like, genuinely, my life was a bit ruined by someone not liking me, and I couldn't sleep, and I would feel physically sick. So I've developed this thing through the jackal bait theory that Fiona Thompson and I have come up with for Super Tribe. I've developed a technique that really does work for me, and it goes like this. If somebody's short with me, off with me, weird with me, you know, somehow snippy or difficult or something like that, I do this. Firstly, I look around and I go, are there any jackals here? And I literally go to the window and I look outside. I live in Camden Town in London. <laughs> and I go, can I see any jackals in the street? No, no jackals. Anything that's going to eat me? No. Okay. Then I go, secondly, have you been detribed? Has the whole tribe left you? Or do you have tribe? And I think about my family and my friends and my comedy tribe and my feminist tribe and all of those different tribes. And I think about all the people I have and all the tribe that I have. And I think, no, I have tribe. So what's going on here? And then I think about this particular relationship with this person. I think, okay, so this person has a problem with me. And I think, is it valid? Is it a valid problem? Have I done something to genuinely upset them that was accidental? And if I have, oh, I should apologize. And I find I can make one warm apology and go, did that upset you? I'm so sorry if it did. And I don't have to keep going, am I in the tribe though? Am I, do you, am I a jackal bait? Do you not like me? Am I, do you not like my berries? Am I going to be jackal bait? Are you going to be, don't, don't, I don't want to be jackal bait. I don't want to be jackal bait. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. No, but I'm really sorry. I don't, I don't have to do that. I just can go, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I really didn't mean to. Let me introduce you so I can fix it. Or if it's their problem, if I think, no, I haven't done anything wrong. They're being jealous because of whatever situation that they felt they deserved or were entitled to something that they weren't. And they're just pissy about their own issues. This has nothing to do with me. In which case, I can just go, it's not my problem. It's not my problem. I am not jackal bait because you're jealous of this little bit of success that I've had here. That is your problem. And I can hunt her up. And what's so exciting about it is that now, in my life, if something's not going well, I think to myself, I think I'm being too hunter where I need to be more gatherer, or I think I'm being too gatherer, usually, where I need to be more hunter. And I start to say, am I putting everyone else over the process and what needs to happen for me to move forward and for this to be great? Or... Am I going hell-bent for leather for this and somehow I'm not listening to people and I'm not taking that on board? And what this means is I've sort of cured myself of this neurosis through looking at the model through this world. But also, please, please never fucking leave me out of brunch. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Hello, hello. It's Jess Foster Q here. Sometimes I co-host this Lush Guilty Feminist. That's where you might know this voice from. I have my own podcast. It's all about eating called Hoovering. So I'm just interrupting to tell you that I've got my first ever live show, live Hoovering in Manchester with stars from Coronation Street, Bake Off and the smash hit podcast All Killer No Filler. Naturally, they're all women brilliant ones at that. There will be eating and laughing occasionally at the same time. Come and join us. It's Saturday 6th of October at lunchtime. Of course it is. Go to manchesterpodcastfestival.com and if you use the secret code vacuum you get 50% off. Please welcome to the stage the one, the only, the Grace Petrie! Hello. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to sing a couple of songs. Uh, I've got a new album out, and uh, and this, this is a song from it. It's quite an old song, actually. I wrote it uh, years and years ago, but I've kind of re-recorded it for this album with a new arrangement. And this is the wankiest introduction to a song that I have. But it's true. Um, So I wrote this song because when I was doing my English A-level, I was studying Shakespeare's Othello, and I wrote a song about the play. Yes, I did. Um, What a knob. Um, (laughs) But uh, is anyone uh, anyone familiar with Othello? Yeah. uh, uh, Shakespeare fans, all of you? Half and half. (laughs) Someone went, nah. Fair enough. But it really stayed with me, the story of Othello, for years and years. And then uh, years later, I was in this relationship um, that I was very insecure about. And I think we'll probably talk about that later on. Because Deborah said, do you want to come on to the the show that's themed uh, to do with jealousy? And I said, wow, the chance to make myself look awful in front of the biggest platform I'll ever play to. (laughs) Yay! Um, (laughs) Sign me up! Um, So... This is called Iago, uh, which is a reference to Othello and not to the <coughs> the parrot in the Disney film Aladdin. <laughs> and you would be surprised how many times I've had to clarify that on stage. <laughs> that I'm my own worst enemy Always trying to wreck what's right in front of me It doesn't mean that I don't understand That every time I force your gentle hand To come and comfort me I make myself your enemy So lay me down, my darling In your bed You lay my demons all to rest But there's Iago sitting on my shoulder Every time I hold her Telling me I'm never gonna make the grade Telling me I'm stupid, kind of self-deluded If I think I got my happy ending made And every time he calls, it ends up in a fall He stands there and he doesn't help me at all Sometimes I think that I'm just running out of time Just heading for the crime When I let myself break my heart with my own two hands Put a bullet in the head of the great romance of my life And I know that Iago will be the only one left alive Sometimes I just don't have the energy To be the things I'm meant to be 
But every time you take me in your arms It's like you drown out the alarms Going off inside of me Nothing but serenity, yeah So lay me down, my darling In your bed You lay my demons all to rest But there's the Argo sitting on my shoulder Every time I hold her Telling me I'm never gonna make the grade Telling me I'm stupid, kind of self-deluded If I think I got my happy ending made And every time he calls, it ends up in a fall He stands there and he doesn't help me at all Sometimes I think that I'm just running out of time Just heading for the crime When I let myself break my heart with my own two hands Put a bullet in the head of the great romance of my life and I know that Iago will be the only one left alive. He'll be the only one left alive. He'll be the only one left alive. You know. I'm my own worst enemy Thank you Another form of jealousy that I experience a lot of the time is the jealousy I have for people who seem to know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> uh, is anybody with me? <laughs> yeah. um, just don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Um, any, any day. And I wrote a song about imposter syndrome. Give me a shout if you've ever suffered from imposter syndrome. Sure, good. Yeah, and I think we all have, haven't we? I think so. I think the only people on earth who have never felt like they were a bit unqualified for what they're doing are people like Donald Trump, who <laughs> you just don't want in charge of anything. I think you want people to be sort of, you know, taking stock of whether or not they're okay. I hope so, anyway. And, I, and like, I'm 31 now, and when, it, when I turned 30, I was saying to my dad, um, I love my dad very much, he's really cool, and I was saying to my dad, oh, I'm not sure that I, I don't feel ready to be 30. I don't think, like, it's a very grown up number. I still feel like I'm about 16. And my dad, who's like 68 now, was like, Yeah, me too. <laughs> I was like, Oh, okay. So it is literally just a fucking lie that one day you feel like a grown up, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? I think if anyone here is younger than 31, spoiler alert, um, if you're waiting for the day that you feel like you've got it all figured out, it just doesn't fucking happen. All, like, all that happens is you, you reach the day when you stop waiting for that day to come. That's what I'm like. So I wrote a song about that, and it's called Nobody Knows That I'm a Fraud. Uh, it goes out to all the frauds in the room. Um, and I'm also... Uh, so at my own gigs, um, I tend to feel like I'm... like This is not a massively contentious question, but it, th no shame here. But give me a shout if you can see yourself a lefty. <laughs> Good, good. Um, cool. <laughs> I said, no shame, but good. Um, no, just good in terms of how much you're going to enjoy this. <laughs> no, I am a lefty, but I'm also I'm quite a shit lefty. Uh, and I know this because I've been told by better lefties on Twitter. Because uh, that's the way the world fucking works, isn't it? Uh, so it's also, it's also a song about not being as left-wing as everybody thinks I am. You call yourself a protest singer and, jeez, you're supposed to be perfect, aren't they? It goes like this. I don't watch PMQs as often as you might expect. <laughs> I only live tweet question time for comedic effect. <laughs> and I'm a feminist, but I've never read Virginia Woolf or any Bertolt Brecht. 
And nobody knows that I'm a fraud It's often been alleged that I'm as hard left as can be But my idea of edgy is an unknown brand of tea And I'm not even fetchy, let alone dairy-free Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Until I feel adored And I'll never tell you anything I think you won't applaud Oh, it might not always be the truth But it'll have three chords Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Well, dressing how I do I find I often get mistook By graphic novel fans Who judge me on the way I look But I just like Batman shirts, I've never read a comic book Nobody knows that I'm a fraud When people call me a musician, that makes my palms perspire I took grade one piano and I never got no higher If I didn't have this capo, then you'd all see I'm a liar Nobody knows that I'm a Until I feel adored And I'll never tell you anything I think you won't applaud Oh, it might not always be the truth But it'll have three chords Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Nobody knows that I'm a fraud And some days I get so scared that we're losing And some days I'm just so sure we'll never win And some days I get so knackered from refusing To let that in, to let that in Well, some days life feels like a play that you have not rehearsed But one thing's true of all of us sharing this universe is we could all be doing better and we could all be doing worse and everyone you know feels like a fraud Come on and get up underneath the lights until you feel adored but never tell them anything you think they won't applaud Oh, it might not always be the truth but it'll have three chords Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Oh, it might not always be the truth but it'll have three chords and I guess I'll take up spoken word when I run out of chords cause nobody knows that I'm a fraud thank you Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah here. I wanted to let you know that our own Grace Petrie is on tour around the UK. Wonderful show. Don't miss it. Go to gracepetrie.com to find dates near you. Felicity Ward is also on tour. Go to felicityward.com to find out where she is. And as always, go to helprefugees.org to find out what they need. Jess Foster Q and I are in Calais today, Monday, and we are working there with the Women's Centre and we'll have a podcast about it for you uh, when we get back. We are trying to get t-shirts together with help refugees so that we can support them. Please don't email or tweet and ask us when they will be ready. We don't know yet, but we will let you know when we do. In the meantime, go to road-from-damascus.co.uk to get one of our Guilty Feminist Collections necklaces. They make great Christmas presents. If you would like to see Say My Name, we will be at the Liverpool Film Festival on October 14th. And we will be at the Cardiff International Film Festival in October as well. Check out both of those festivals to see when Say My Name is going on sale. It's my screwball comedy that I wrote and have a cameo in. It's produced by a woman, fabulous strong woman in the lead. I think you're really going to enjoy it. 
If you would like to see it where you are, hashtag say my name movie and let us know and we will encourage distributors to bring it to you. If you'd like to see my late night satirical Channel 4 show next week's news, if you don't like this week's news, let's try and change it in time for next week's news at Channel 4 and ask them when it will be on, hashtag next week's news. I am also a contributor to the amazing pink protest book, Feminists Don't Wear Pink and Other Lies. It's a fabulous collection of essays by various contemporary feminists. And I'm hosting an event for Feminists Don't Wear Pink with Scarlett Curtis on the 3rd of October at the Lowry in Manchester. And I'm a contributor to another event on the 4th of October in London at the Rio Cinema. Please buy tickets for one of those if you would like to. I would love to to see you there. And finally, we don't sell advertising on this podcast. We don't ask for Patreon and we don't have any other revenue really except for selling tickets to events. And we do it every week of the year. We never take a break and we would love your help and support. And the best way you can do that is to buy my book, The Guilty Feminist. It is my view on contemporary feminism and how we can build a better world and one that we all want to live in. I've tried to include interviews to make it more intersectional. I hope you will really, really enjoy the book. If you would buy it in hardback, it would really help us keep the podcast going. You can get it at Waterstones, other good bookshops. Uh, I see it's on sale now in Australia as well. Amazon.co.uk if you absolutely have to. But if you could get a copy while it's in hardback, it's about 15 quid and it would really, really help us to keep the podcast going. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate it. We want to keep the content free. And I hope that you find the book of great value. And now back to the podcast. Has anyone got a feminist t-shirt? I forgot to ask at the beginning. Got feminism in the front row? Anybody else? What are you wearing? Shout out. Um, why be racist, sexist, homophobic, and transphobic when you can just be quiet? Oh. <laughs> it's a very good question. It's a very, you can be silently those things, but it's much more pleasant for the people around you. Anybody else? What is that what your t shirt says? What is, on Wednesdays, we smash the Patreon. Yes! I feel it should be on Mondays, though, because that's the day the podcast comes out. Why is it Wednesdays? It's mean Girls. On Wednesdays, we wear pink. Oh! <laughs> Stop Don't test me. trying to make my special fetch subject. happen! Oh, it's Mean Girls. It's literally the Gatherer movie. Wow, I can't believe I missed that. Um, well, I'm going to make a T-shirt that says, on Mondays, we smash the patriarchy. <laughs> Do, we are going to start doing T-shirts, actually. Um, we are going to start doing T-shirts. Because we had them, but it was like a whole thing. Like, there's two things. One is keeping them in all the sizes, like your gap. Oh, yeah. Which we're not. And secondly, I just felt a bit uncomfortable about putting feminism on a T-shirt and selling it. So, we've made an arrangement with Help Refugees. The way they do their T-shirts is ASOS print them to order and ASOS handle all of the sizing and everything, and the money, the profit goes to help refugees. Oh, cool. So I'm like, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And that way we don't carry them and we don't profit from them, but everyone still gets to have a T-shirt and kind of fill in the club mm -hmm. so that you see someone else in a T-shirt and you're like, high five. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it is good. It just makes me feel quite bad about the fact that my own Grace Petrie T-shirts literally only profit me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, that's fine. No, there's nothing wrong with it. But your T-shirts say Grace Petrie. They don't say yeah. That feminism. is an ideology, though, I think, as well. Yeah. In, its own, in its own way. That's different from feminism. You know, sometimes you go into somewhere like Gap, mm. and they're like, feminists are fun. And you're like, who made that? Yeah. Doesn't feel great. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, What's yeah, it? and like Top Shop have started doing like Bob Dylan T-shirts and Black Set. Do you know what I mean? By yeah. This? Which is so a I'm bit like, weird. I just, it's not, I'm not judging anyone else for doing it. I'm a bit, but I'm not really. I just thought, what's a nicer way of doing this? And also, it came out the podcast today, Steve Alley, who some of you know, I've talked about, and he's on Grown Up Land. He's a Syrian refugee, and he learned to be a silversmith. He was an architect mm. in, or an architecture student. He always likes me to say, not an architect. I was an architecture student at the University of Damascus when the war broke out and it was a kill or be killed situation, so he left. When he got to the Calais jungle, he learned to be a silversmith and he started off because there was no materials and he missed his, he always had beautiful silver jewelry and he left it with his mum. He said, the thing is, I got in the dinghy with my life, mm. but thought, leave the jewelry. 
Because <laughs> what if it drowns? <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely, he did that. He was like, no, 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 sir. So he didn't have any of his jewellery. So he started using things like nails and things you could find in a refugee camp, what, electrical wiring and stuff to make his own jewellery. And he learnt from other people in the camp who were silversmiths. And he started this whole company. It's called Road from Damascus. I came up with the title. And uh, so I commissioned from him some necklaces. So they're really beautifully made silver necklaces that say Guilty Feminist. And there's another design he's doing for us as well that's part of our Guilty Feminist collection. That's right, we have a collection. Um, it's the word woman in Arabic. And so that's the sort of more, if you're one of those people that doesn't like people knowing, do you know what I mean? Like you don't want to be too on the nose. You get the woman one, which is the secret one. And if you're just out and out, I'm a guilty feminist, I'm proud of it, woohoo, you get that one. <laughs> or you get both for different days, different feelings, different moods. Um, but I also. The one is like closeted. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. But I also want him to do one. Do you remember there was a woman who came on who was teaching people Chinese? Yeah. We were breaking down the Chinese symbol for feminism, and one of the words was gender. And I said, how did that break down? And she said, the sign for gender is the birth of your heart. And I was like, Aww. isn't that, I know, right? And I was like, isn't that beautiful for transgender people? Yeah. It's the birth of your heart. It's not the birth of your body. So Steve can make that necklace, yeah. the birth of your heart as gender. And I just think that's just so beautiful. Yeah. And half of the profit will go to Steve's continuing education so he can start doing a degree again. And the other half will go to his mother's project. His mother is a refugee in Turkey, and she always took refugees in when Steve was growing up because Syria had more refugees than anywhere coming in. And he always said, his mother used to say, well, I would hope someone would do it for you. I know. And um, so um, he said to me one day, I don't know if you believe in karma, and I don't know if I believe in karma, but that's what my mum always said to me. And so she's got a project in Turkey that helps women who are refugees get a craft because often they've had amazing jobs and careers and things, but then they turn up somewhere, they don't speak the language, they don't always have papers. So if they can do something like become a silversmith and sell those products, it's like a beautiful thing where they're keeping a craft alive and also they're able to sell something. Uh, so please go to, it's road-from-damascus.co.uk and you can see that the Guilty Feminist Collection, which I hope will grow. What is Mama's organisation called? I don't know what the name of that project is, but it'll be in Arabic and Turkish. It's more like her local project rather than it being like a mini NGO or something like that. I just um, want to say that was mm. such a lovely sort of inquisitive and uh, sensitive heckle. And the only other one we've had is and hose. <laughs> <laughs> really covering both ends of the spectrum there. Sorry. I'd like to support this small grassroots project in <laughs> Turkey. I'm going to need the website and hose. Yes. Um, <laughs> today's guest is a comedian and actor whose career started in Biker Grove. Is that where Anton Deck started? Yes. It is. PJ and Duncan is how they used to be known. PJ and Duncan? PJ and Duncan. Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> well, let's get ready to rumble right now because our next guest is a Newcastle local. Please put your hands together and make extraordinary Geordie Wahooing noises for Sammy Dobson! <laughs> Me mum's in. Hello. <laughs> you all right? I'm going to tell you some probably too intimate stuff about myself on the theme of jealousy whilst hopefully making you laugh and not terrifying you to your very core. <laughs> that will happen. Um, I was, uh, I'll, I'll put a little bit at the start of this by saying I was single for six years. Uh, and I don't mean no to six. It was... Um, <laughs> 22 to 28, that's, the, that's when you want to be single. Um, it did lead to the Google search, can you get industrial white finger from vibrator misuse? Um, <laughs> you can. But it's, it's all right now, because uh, I, I, I managed to trap a man in a huge net and he can't escape. Um, 
big tip for anyone who feels like they do need a man in their lives uh, and they're lacking one, uh, condensed history, what you need to do is, right, uh, come into money somehow, buy a house outright and then charge them no rent to live in it. <laughs> and he's really got to want to leave that situation financially. <laughs> He's got to weigh that one up for a while. I am living here rent free, but I do. No, it's fine. I'll get on with it. So uh, we've been together for four and a half years, um, but it, it, it's great. And it was really, it's really nice. I'm not bragging. I'm not bragging. I've got a boyfriend. Not bragging. Um, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> he comes home from work. And I'm like trousers off. <laughs> he just does it. <laughs> oh, it's like having a dog. Um, <laughs> Not like that, not like that. But it, it was nice because I was single for so long. I mean, Nana was quite worried about us. You, you'll understand, Geordie Nanas, the worry terribly. <laughs> when I was 16 and not pregnant or wed, she was sweating. <laughs> you don't need a degree, our Sammy. You don't need one. I do, Nana, that's how it works now. She thought I was a vegetarian. She meant lesbian. It was a very confusing... <laughs> ...time for Nana. Um, but it was lovely because I got to take around this real man who I didn't technically pay to be there. And I was like, Nana, this is me boyfriend. Oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that exciting? And she loves him. Oh, she absolutely loves him. She always like, buys him special chocolates. And I mean, I think she sort of fancies him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's nice. But um, Nana need to remember that I will cut a bitch. <laughs> And her osteoporosis will just play into my hands. <laughs> She'll crumble like dust in the wind. <laughs> that gets us on to me problem. I've got a little problem, you see. Uh, and it it's, uh, dwells in me very soul <laughs> and sort of navigates every thought I have. And, and that is jealousy. I'm a very jealous person. I'll give you an example of this. Recently, my partner was having a shit. <laughs> and I timed them all. And this one... <laughs> this one just seemed to take that little bit too long. <laughs> and in that few minutes extra time, I had convinced myself that what he was really doing was FaceTiming a new woman... <laughs> And the reason I couldn't hear anything through the door was she was deaf. <laughs> and he hadn't been staying extra at work to help with their workload. He'd secretly been doing BSL at night to talk to his deaf bitch through FaceTime, <laughs> claiming it's a big shit. It wasn't. I know that. He had food poisoning. Um, <laughs> It's really hard, like when I'm in front of lovely people like you, when I'm on a stage, when I'm doing comedy, I feel like I can just tell the truth and just say things that come out of my mouth and it's fine, it's like a safe space, I can just get away with it. I've said some awful things on stage, <laughs> all of them true. Um, <laughs> terrible. But when I go home, that's when I have to start pretending. That's when the act starts. Because oh, I have to pretend not to be fully insane. <laughs> I have to be like, oh, carefree, <laughs> isn't life wonderful? My mind isn't ricocheting off its own shell with thoughts of what you're doing with other women. <laughs> I just love you. <laughs> so he comes home from work and, and I'll be like, hello. <laughs> have, you, have you had a nice day? <laughs> oh, oh, God. Would you like a lovely roast chicken for tea? <laughs> And he'll say something like, yeah, I've had a lovely day, actually. I've been, um, I've been working with Sarah from... Uh, ah! <laughs> because the last thing my brain heard there... Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> That's a woman's name. <laughs> oh, Sarah. <laughs> but I have to become a swan. My face has to become the head of the swan, just gliding peacefully, nodding, mm, smiling, mmm, Sarah. But my brain is very much the feet of the swan beneath the surface, just gone aka. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> who's Sarah? Is she young? Is she? Oh, she's in her twenties. That's a. Oh, that's nice. She doesn't 
Shave our toes yet, Sarah! That's... <laughs> She makes a cup of tea just, just the way he likes it. Oh, I'm happy for you. <laughs> oh, that is lovely, Sarah. Does she have nice hair? -er? <laughs> Does she have matching underwear, -er, Sarah? <laughs> I love the sound of Sarah. Let's all go for dinner together. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be best friends. <laughs> Sarah! <laughs> Did Sarah go to a karaoke bar in Newcastle and try and hit a very high note and shit herself? No, Sammy did. <laughs> Well, you see what I'm going to do? <laughs> I'm going to get my friend, my friend to start working where you both work. <laughs> and I'm going to give my friend drugs. <laughs> drugs to put in Sarah's handbag. <laughs> and then I'm going to call the police and say, hello. <laughs> you know, Sarah, who works at Vera, lovely hair, matching underwear, that's the bitch. <laughs> She's dealing drugs to kids. Oh. <laughs> And then, when they come in and drag her out by her lovely hair... Uh, <laughs> let's see how much you love her then, shall we? <laughs> Would you like a rice pudding for, for afters? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to leave now and check up on him. Uh, bye. <laughs> Sammy Dobson, everybody. <laughs> so join us, join us, join us, Sammy. So we've both declared a little bit about how we feel about jealousy. <laughs> and you, you have too now. Um, <laughs> Were you jealous as a child? I've really put the work in for this episode of the Guilty Feminist podcast by being jealous from birth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very unique situation, but, oh, stay with us on this one. I'm an only child. What, really? Um, <laughs> and my dad thought I needed competition because I didn't have siblings. So what he did, from me being about two years old, was invent a sibling... An imaginary sibling who was the same age as me, who was better than me at everything. Really? And he... Are you sure that's not a comedy bit? <laughs> no, and my therapist will attest. <laughs> as will what? her lovely new car. Um, did, did he... <laughs> did, did, did he say this child was real and elsewhere? She seemed real to me. She was called Sean. Do you know what? If I meet anyone called Sean now, I ripple. I just can't yeah. deal with it. So she was called Sean, mm -hmm. and so your dad said your sister Sean would do. She Anything, can ride a bike. Yeah, that came up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was just a for instance. I didn't mean to trigger you. <laughs> trigger warning, fictional siblings. Um, <laughs> He used to incite me to hurt her. What? Whoa. So I'd go and try and cuddle him, and he'd be like, no, you can't, because Sean's here. Mmm, what a lovely cuddle. So I'd... <laughs> someone just went, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to have that validated, because you carry it for a long time going, oh, that was just Dad's little joke. <laughs> I wonder why I'm a comedian. Um, <laughs> I notice on your ankle, if it's okay to say, you yeah. have Mam and Dad I do. tattooed on your ankle. I is, mean, apart is, from that, he was lovely. I was going to say, <laughs> is that to win us up? What does Sean have tattooed on her ankle? <laughs> I think my dad's just got Sean tattooed on his. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't surprise us. Oh, God. Oh, I've, I've entered the pit again. But it, it was anything. So if I got nine out of ten on a spelling test, he would look at it and go, mm, Sean got ten. No way. To the point where I'm, the day I got my A-level results... <gasps> 
what? It was still going on? Yeah, I'd been really ill in the lead up to my A-levels. I missed about three months of school, hospitalised a lot. So I got three Bs and I'd really wanted my three A's. And my dad looked at my results sheet and went, oh, Sean got three A's. Yeah. And honestly, I just felt the tears well in my... And he just meant it as a joke because he knew mm. how much it bothered me. But I was like, of course she did. <laughs> I now have a theory, because I don't know you, Sammy, <laughs> that you did have a sister called Sean and you killed her. We were all thinking it, I think. Yeah. And the narrative you have now is she was yeah. always imaginary. I have worried that. Yeah. <laughs> did you have... How were you as a child? Did you have siblings? Is it all right I to have siblings, this? yes. I'm the youngest of four. I am just sickeningly spoiled <laughs> by my whole family. And the best example I could tell you about my lifelong relationship with jealousy was when I was very small, very young, I should say, <laughs> <laughs> it's never not funny um, if you're listening at home Grace is very how, small Grace how, is very how, small how tall are you Grace? I've never measured myself I think I'd find it quite a depressing experience okay yeah. so, uh, sorry continue no, I, it's heard, I didn't mean to provoke jealousy over height no issues. it's fine it's sorry. fine I'm sorry we're quite tall it's in how many tall ways where it stems from I'm uh, tall but I do tower far off Grace yeah. Far far, yeah, do you know what Sean's taller than you though <laughs> 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 and she doesn't have hairy toes. <laughs> if, you, if you're listening at home, Grace has had to go and give Sammy a hug. I'm five nine and a half, and Sean, I know, is only five seven. So <laughs> fuck her. Good. The bitch. Um, <laughs> and ho. And ho. Um, yeah, no, so when I was little, I had this red bowl that I'd have my cereal out of in the morning. And I was the only one, out of four kids, I don't know why, I was the only one who had a red bowl, presumably because of the qualities that I display in this story. But uh, when we were, we went on holiday to France with our cousins, big family who's the same number of siblings as us, all really close, loved it. And we were staying in a gite in France. And I remember, I was probably, I think, my memory is that I was, this was before school. So I was like three or something, three or four. And I remember my parents being very specific about the woods near the jeet you couldn't go in them because there was snakes there was adders in the woods like if you you know this is true i think um <laughs> and i was like yeah that's cool that has been really impressed on me about the adders in the woods and then one day i came into the kitchen and my cousin was eating cereal oh no gasps from the audience <laughs> <laughs> they know what's coming from my fucking Red Bull. <laughs> Eating cereal from my Red Bull, and my auntie, in her ignorance of the rules of the Red Bull, her son needed feeding, it's fine. Um, and he was eating cereal out of the Red Bull, and I didn't kick off. I didn't say anything at all. I just walked out and kept it all inside. And then the moment that the Red Bull was unattended, I took it into the snake-infested woods <laughs> and buried it. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is true. I buried the bowl. Because it had been Because it had been used by someone else, yeah. <laughs> so there's no point, it's no good anymore. No, and I risked the snakes, Deborah. <laughs> I was ah. like, if I die, I die, you know. <laughs> this transgression will not stand. Have you written a song about this? Not yet, but Called. I think there's a whole concept album in it, to be there honest. There is, there is. Adders in the bowl. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Serial yeah. killer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it is. It's chilling, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. definitely, it feels like something that would be like the intro paragraph on a serial killer's Wikipedia page, I think. Yeah, to be honest, neither of you are coming up great on your childhood <laughs> profiles. What about, what about you? Jealous kid? Um, no, I wasn't. My sister was four years older than me. And I desperately wanted her to love me and be friends with me. But you know when someone's four years older and they're kind of four years cleverer? And so I was always a bit uncool. Like she was eight and I was four. Mm. She was 12 and I was eight. And I do remember... I mean, that's how time works. And, <laughs> I didn't want to say. But, you, know, you know what I mean? If you're a 12-year-old, I don't want to hang out with an eight-year-old. You know what I mean? But she used to invent games to ignite jealousy so one was Barbie gymnastics. So our Barbies would have gymnastic tournaments and hers would always win because she was the judge. <laughs> um, 
And one Christmas, we got this really beautiful, sort of like handmade Swedish doll's house, which sounds like we were rich. We weren't, but it was like a big deal that we got it. It came from our elf, but that's a different story. We had an elf that we used to entertain. Anyway, um, <laughs> we did. We made parties for it. It was like a family thing. <sighs> the, elf would, <laughs> the elf would leave us notes, and then we would leave the note for the elf saying, we're going to plan your party tonight, so tell all your elf friends. <laughs> And we used to make, out of tin foil and like little bits of marshmallow and stuff, a whole ball for the elves. Wow. And then we'd wake up in the morning and the elves would have had a good time and uh, <laughs> wrecked the place and left us a note saying, thank you very much, we had a great time. You and, were never um, invited to your own elf party? We were, well, I hate to break this to you. I think, I think it was our parents <laughs> doing it, like leaving the notes in tiny writing and and messing up the party. And the reason we weren't invited is we would have been disappointed to see no elves. Well, I'm so, so glad yours invented elves and mine invented siblings for me to war with. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. No, I do, I do, I do see now. That seems unfair. <laughs> so I hate to tell you this. I am Sean. Um, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm what a twist <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was kind of a, like, a really big deal we got this lovely doll's house and it was the kind of thing my mother would or my elf would buy it had a sort of flip top and very simple sort of dolls and stuff my sister invented a game where she would have the dolls in the doll's house and I would have two cotton reels under the <laughs> under the pedals of the piano and that would be my house. And the cotton reel dolls, we just drew a face on cotton reels, basically, little <laughs> cotton reels. And the game was called Rich Man, Poor Man. <laughs> very gendered, very gendered looking back. Why wasn't it Rich Family, Poor Family? I don't know. It was called Rich Man, Poor Man. She invented it. And the game went like this. Her fancy doll's house family would come over and say, would you like to come over? And then the cotton reels would come out from under the... <laughs> pedals of the piano and go over and they would give <laughs> my cotton reels a tour of the house and it was lovely all the rooms and then they'd say oh can we come to your house <laughs> and I'd go yep <laughs> then, <laughs> then they'd come over and go oh this is not great <laughs> that was the full game Wow. My sister and I still laugh about rich man, poor man, but she was just older and clearly not a socialist. <laughs> I was going to say, it's very classist, this yeah. game, yeah. isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Marx would have a fucking field day with that. I mean, you? seriously, that was because she was a child and she was just trying to wind me up. That's more excusable, though. My, my dad went to extreme lengths to wind me up because he thought it was good for me. And Did I had to call the police once. Did you? Did Sean break in? Yeah. <laughs> Did she? It was self-defence, Deborah. Nightmares. Um, no, we were playing Frustration. You know the board game with the... Bop, oh, yeah. bop, bop. oh, I loved that. We called that Trouble in Australia. It yeah. is Trouble. He, um, <laughs> he kept getting sixes because he was rubbing his lucky moustache on it. Now, <laughs> it wasn't a pocketed one. It was the one on his face. He was face down on the carpet rubbing his lucky moustache on the dice and every time coming up sixes. Now, I was getting more and more annoyed, so he thought this was more and more brilliant, to the point where I just simply had to call the police. Did you call the police? Because the police at four sixes. years old. They didn't think I would know how, but I did get through. And I said, it's not fair, my dad's using magic to win frustration. Did the officers come? Uh, my mum got the phone in my hand and went, I'm sorry, she got hold of the phone, she's only four, and her dad is using magic. Um, <laughs> Is Sean a sort of thing of the past now, just to be clear? <laughs> yes. Is she a much more successful comedian? <laughs> <laughs> it is, and I've sort of forgiven my dad to an extent. But when you said that, honestly, I was like, I could feel the tears coming and going, yeah, she probably is, isn't she? She's been on Live at the Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> She's England's comedy sweetheart. She's Sarah Millican. I don't know. Like... <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Just to be clear, Sarah Millican, if you're listening, we love you. You're a friend of the I show. Love her. And we love you. But my uh, boyfriend works in South Shields and she is from there, so now that's going to be my new panic at night. <laughs> if he cheated on me with a more successful comedian... Oh, my God, right. <laughs> well, there's a worry I didn't know I had. <laughs> Do you think women are trained to be more jealous? Do you think... I mean, obviously, you have been trained to be jealous, specifically... 
and not just by the patriarchy, but by your actual pater. Very specific <laughs> patriarchy. That is, I mean, that's almost too good an example. <laughs> I think men aren't compared as much as women. I think... As soon as a woman does something, she's like the last woman who did it. Whereas so many men mm. get to have goes at things. Yeah. Well, I just noticed when I did Mock the Week, some people would write in, they're directly comparing you to another woman mm. that they've seen on the show and they want to tell you that you're better or worse than another woman in their opinion. Mm. But they're not comparing you to all the men you're sitting next to. Yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Do you get compared to other women? Are you more likely to get compared to a female folk singer or an LGBT folk singer? Um, or... It's a similar thing, but my pet hate is like the female something. Mm. Do you know what I mean mm. by that? Like I get the female Billy Bragg, I get a lot. You oh, know? I'm really No, sorry, no, no, but I you began... didn't call me the female. I didn't. You didn't call me the female anything. I said you are Billy no, Bragg, Bragg, Hannah, Hannah Gadsby, Gadsby, Joni, Joni Mitchell, Mitchell. Mitchell. And what a pedigree, one, to be honest. one person. If they were in a body swapping film, a three-way body swapping <laughs> film... And they were just biting into a fortune cookie as the lightning struck. <laughs> and then they all swapped one around. And then It's merged. a specific film we're talking about, isn't I mean, it? It's a very they were in Freaky Friday. Let's just it's call a, a spade a spade. It's a niche film. Yeah. I will grant you that. Just because you miss me and girls, you can't get your Lindsay Lohan points back now. <laughs> oh, I can. Yeah, oh, I okay. can. Yeah. I can. I feel a man can be his own person in a sphere oh yeah but if you're a female judge you must get compared to other female judges yeah if you're a female research scientist you mm. must get compared to the famous woman sure. rather than just getting compared to other people in your field well i think it's just still the fact that like men are just the standard so much of the time so like how many of us have had a gig where they were like oh god we've got to find a man for the bill <laughs> do you know what i mean like that's just I not... ha i've had that have, well you you're probably yeah. the only person in yeah, entertainment I, that has I, I, that I don't problem. worry too much about it i think if i haven't got a man for the bill i mean on the guilty feminist obviously i don't feel any pressure to put a man mm. on the bill global pillage and grown up land which i book yeah. occasionally i do think we've had a lot of very female heavy shows yeah. and i haven't booked a male guest in a little while yeah. i know i'm in the minority and i know also i have an unconscious bias Somebody said to me for a show that I was booking, can you book more guys? Because you're booking, you know, we want this to appeal to men and women. And I was like, well, they never worry about that no. with it's the other way around. Sure. But okay, fine. They were suggesting some names who were white straight guys. Mm. Who I'm sure are very good. But I realized that I was kind of like, I don't really know these guys. Are they going to be funny? And yeah. I realized because I never see white straight men be funny mm. because all of the shows <laughs> I book... I just, in my head, I went, are they going to be funny, though? Mm. Are they going to be talented? Are they going to be good? And I went, oh, my God. I've got the opposite bias <laughs> that all of the people who book comedy clubs have mm. because they don't see women be funny very yeah. often. So they're like, and they saw one once and she was uncomfortable on the bill because she was the only woman and she wasn't introduced properly and blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Or she just had an off night or she wasn't very good. Mm. And then they've made an assumption that all women are going to be that. Mm. And they've just already decided. And I just realized, I was like, shit, I've got the thing yeah. where I go, I just, it's not that I'm sure white straight men are funny. <laughs> you I sound just, like an apologist. I just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just don't see any evidence of it. Yeah. I don't, I haven't <laughs> seen it. I haven't seen it. And I was, there was a guy that I'd just done a thing with. And I was like, he's good. I know him. He's great. We can have him. Yeah. And I was doing the thing that they do, which yeah. is, I know a woman who's funny, we'll book her and that'll be the funny one. And I did mm. exactly that for white straight men. I'm in a microclimate, mm. and I've written about this in the book, The Guilty Feminist is a microclimate where women do well. Mm. And I just know, when I've had men on occasionally, I've seen it happen. The audience are polite, <laughs> but the response, the response that you gave Grace and that you gave Sammy and that you gave me, if I now said, and now this guy, this is what happens. The audience go... They're nice, so they'll go, mm, good. <laughs> but I see them sort of slightly stiffen, and they just lean forward like, we'll hear you out, white man, but you better have something to say. Yeah. And I see the guy often make a joke that goes a bit wrong or something, and they're a bit sweaty, yeah. and they look like the woman on the panel. Of course, yeah, yeah. So what happens? And that's what it is, it's just that you start from less than zero. Do you know what I mean? I, it um, does feel like I'm a feminist, but that sounds lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I'd love that happen more often. Yeah. yeah, it's the architecture of support that mm. breeds and builds confidence. You've talked about being jealous romantically, Sammy, and you've talked about being jealous as a kid. Do you feel that in a professional realm? Do you feel like you're pitted against women or there is a professional jealousy? Sometimes do you feel like that thing of, 
Oh. I definitely do a bit. And I think it's sadly because my conditioned first response to everything is jealousy. Everything. Because of how I was brought up. My gut reaction straight away is jealous. And then to go, pleased for you. And I have to... <laughs> <laughs> It's the sort of primal brain kicks in and does the jealousy and then the learned, mm, well-read, nice person trying to be has to go, no, but that is good for her and we are pleased about that and I am. But I only really feel, I, I've, I think it's because my best friends aren't comedians. Mm. I think if... Good call. <laughs> mm. On so I mean, many levels. They're funny lasses, but I can be very pleased for their success because it doesn't affect mine. That sounds horrible, but might be true. Um, <laughs> but my very good friends who are comedians, if they're afforded an opportunity that I'm not, and I think it is because it's rarer for women, my instant reaction is, why did she get that and I didn't? Yeah. And then I have to go, but she's my mate, and I'm really mm. happy for her. And I am genuinely happy, but it doesn't stop the beast. Mm. It just sort of goes, hides away, precious, mm. precious. Mm. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I do too. And I think it's about, I'm really trying to fight this now by us all creating our microclimates because do you know what they make us think? There's only one spot at the top for a woman. Yes, exactly. And if you help yeah. someone else, she'll get it and you won't. Yeah. Yeah. And while they keep that thing where there's three or four women allowed on the telly or mm. there's three or four women allowed in these spots, whatever your industry is, that mm. there's a, how many f female CEOs in your industry, how many, you know, that's what they do. They go, oh, there's only one spot. And I hear women in the corporate world talking about it, that there's this, how many women are there on the board? Let's mm. be honest. There's 12 people on the board. One of them's a woman. So if I start helping you, what if you're better than me? Mm. And then you get the, you know, next time a woman dies and mm. there's another one allowed on the board... <laughs> You're going to get it. Mm. So why am I helping you? So I'm better off helping guys and making allies of men yeah. because they can do jobs for the boys. They can do scratch each other's backs. And we have to stop that as women. We have mm. to start scratching each other's backs because that's how they do it. They all help each other up the ladder. They invent the ladder. They build another ladder together. Yeah. And they, they all give each other legs up. And women are going, oh, no, I couldn't possibly... It would be unfair for me to give another woman a spot. People are going to think that I'm helping women through or you're going to get it and I'm not. We've got to stop that collectively. I'm not saying you. I feel like I'm... Just, <laughs> you have to stop that, Grace. I know what you do. You don't help any women in folk. <laughs> I tear them all fucking down. That's what I do. You should yeah. write a song about that. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, they literally have... It's called the Old Boys Club. They mm. literally... You know, we need... We need a new girls' An network. An old girls' club sounds... <laughs> we need a new girls' network. New girls' network, yeah. Mm. yeah. I honestly thought you said nude girls' network then. I was like, <laughs> That's a different on. website. Uh, far away from Guilty Feminist. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions they want to throw about jealousy or about feminism in general or... Where Grace got her waistcoat? <laughs> Anything like that? You don't have MS to. kids every time. <laughs> I may be short, but I don't pay VIT on most of my clothes. <laughs> hey. I suspect all the questions are going to be about Sean. <laughs> Please, can we not focus on her tonight? <laughs> all the hands have gone down. <laughs> okay, I had more. Hi, thanks for coming to the Northeast. Um, <laughs> Thank you for having us. We will be coming back. You're the nicest audience ever. Great. Um, I was wondering if you had any tips or stories on dealing with jealousy when it's with your friends and kind of, yeah, being jealous of like the people who are really close to you and then they have successes and they're possibly in your sector and you're just like... <laughs> but also... I love you, so. <laughs> Is it Gore Vidal who said, it's not enough for me to succeed, my friends must fail? <laughs> um, and I think he also said, every time a friend of mine succeeds, a little piece of me dies. And I remember the day that he died tweeting, someone must have won an Oscar. Um, <laughs> The way I see it is whenever a friend of mine succeeds, and this industry is so ostentatious when someone succeeds, you can't miss it. But what I always think is, if it can happen for someone I know and hang out with and have coffee with, then it can happen for me. It makes it real to me. So I remember when Fleabag got on television, it felt like, oh, so television's possible for women. Mm. It felt like, what? Someone I know that I hang out with, that I've hung out with and had drinks with at Edinburgh and 
that made me believe again. Mm. Because I'd started to think it's not really possible. Mm. It's for other people. It's for men. It's not for me. Mm. So I think that's a great way to look at it. And also ask them what things they did. If they've got something that you want, ask their advice. Everyone loves to be an expert. It's the most complimentary thing you can do and status raising thing you can do is to ask someone for advice. Do you know what I mean? Like when Joey asked Rachel, <laughs> my, my little sister wants to be in fashion and she wants to talk to an expert and she went, oh, I guess I could ask one of my bosses. And he went, no, I want them to talk to you. And she went, oh my God, I'm the expert. And because we'd grown up with Rachel, seen her pouring the coffee and being all lost, it felt like a big moment for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Grace. <laughs> when Phoebe from Friends succeeds singing in the coffee shop, do you feel a little piece of you come alive? Uh, I feel very seen. Uh, by Phoebe. But I was just going to say that um, I think it's true about this industry that we're in. We're in slightly different industries, but um, you said that when someone succeeds, it's very ostentatious. But I think that increasingly, because of social media, it's like that for everyone, I think. I had a funny thing where the last time I was single and I got out of a relationship, sometimes you really focus on a relationship and then when it's over, you look up and all of your friends have gone. And then there was someone who I wanted to make friends with and I kept seeing that she was posting all of these great pictures on Facebook and I was like, she's just having the best life ever. She's having the best time. And then we became really good friends. Now she's one of my best friends. And, you know, she said to me that, like, actually, you know, she felt like she didn't really have any friends in Leicester before. And I think that that's quite an interesting thing. I'm really aware that, like, these days... Like, it's probably worse if you're in any way, like, in performance. But I think it's true, like, the internet makes us all into performers. And I think that mm. you're supposed to be, like, your brand all the time is how great everything's going. Do you know what I mean? You're like, it's our first anniversary and we're drinking champagne and, like, selfie, buying my first house, like, and all this stuff. And I, like, make a real point of trying to tweet that, like... I'm having, like, the shittest day. I'm having the worst time. Because I think it is really... Like, we can all get a bit lost in that. And I think that, like, something that I realised a few years ago, like, January is... Anyone who is trying to be a musician will tell you January is the worst time because you are trying to get booked for festivals. You're applying for festivals. Festivals is like the be-all and end-all. You're so focused on festivals. And you're sitting there waiting for the phone to ring. You've sent thousands and thousands of applications to festivals. It's just not coming in. And all around you, oh, my God, everyone is just tweeting, just have the best thing confirmed. Can't tell you what it is yet, but uh, best gig of my life. Hashtag can't wait for the summer. And you're like, oh, I hate you. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, something that I realised a few years ago, and it's related to advice, I think, is that it's so easy to look around at everyone and be like, everyone is doing better than me. It's so easy. Like, that's the easiest thing in the world. I think social media exacerbates it so much. But what helps me is to think that, like, there's always someone thinking that about you. Like, mm. you don't know it, but there's always someone somewhere in the corner, there's someone looking at your post going, fuck, she's got it all. You know, I think we're all in this, like, same bubble it's, together. It's like, not to quote your lyrics back at you, <laughs> but in that last song, you, where you say, we could all be doing better and we could all be doing worse. Yeah. I find that a very poignant lyric, because that's the truth, and I will die that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will. Well, <laughs> I'll die... I could have done better and I could have done worse. And th on that yeah. day, I'll get up. I mean, if I am able to get up. <laughs> I think you're dead. No, before I die, I'm going to oh, die sorry, in the sorry, afternoon. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. And what if I get up in the morning yeah. and die in the afternoon? Yeah. You're not thinking this through. And that day, I could have done better and I could have done worse. And it's when I accept that, I'm just so much happier because I just go, oh, so today I'm doing as well as I can, and if I'd pushed a bit harder, I could have done better. But you know what? Look at what I did do. And it's a really nice thing to do. Sammy, do you have some wise words to sum up? God, to sum up the whole thing? No, I'm not that no, wise. No, no. <laughs> some, what I would say about that is, all I ever think is if I've got myself into a particularly dark, nasty corridor, is if it's my like, best mate, if I had something I was really happy about and really pleased about and something I'd worked really hard for, I'd want her to be on my side. So if it's the other way around, I know mm. she needs me mm. to be her cheerleader. Mm -hmm. So I have to put everything else to one side and go, I'm so happy for you. 
I am your support network and I am your cheerleader and this is brilliant because the last thing I'd want in the world is for my best mate to go, oh, I can't tell Sammy, she'll be really annoyed. So I think that's, mm. it's always, I always try and flip it the other way around. How would I feel if I was in that position? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's all you can do really. Mm. And remembering what Grace said is to somebody else you are in that position. Somebody else wants what you have. And I think it's really easy. There's friends of mine who've had two kids and then like, I'm off the grid, like everyone's forgotten about me. Mm. And I'm like, I know it feels that way, but also I tried to have children and I couldn't. So there are times when I will look at what you have and be like, that seems sure. pretty amazing. Yeah. So like whatever you have, not that I'm envying all of your children, by the way, yeah. only the cute ones. Um, <laughs> most of them are horrible. Um, and you all know if you have to, you know which one's the horrible <laughs> one. Um, Sean. <laughs> And the hose. <laughs> um. This is the bit where you make other people jealous. Grace Petrie, do you have anything to plug? Oh, I'm playing in Newcastle um, at the end of October, and it has sold dismally. <laughs> so uh... don't say that. Don't say that. No, don't this say is what I'm that. saying is fucking real. Say life, there's man. hardly <laughs> no. there's hardly any tickets left. Get no. one tonight. I refuse. Oh I refuse God. to participate in the charade. Um, uh, it's real life, man. Some of my shows so well, some of them don't. Um, uh, <laughs> it's um. It's at the Cumberland Arms on the 28th of October. What night is it? 20... <laughs> this is the best audience Not ever. prepared for the love for the Cumberland Arms. Ah. I mean, it's nice enough, but wow. Uh, the 28th of 28th October. 28th of October. You can get tickets will, at gracepetrie.com. Will you all be there? Okay, so that show's okay, sold. It's, uh, all right. You can't all be there. It's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's an 80 capacity venue. I was aiming high. Uh, well, then do get in quickly tonight yeah. because these other bitches and hoes are going to get the tickets. <laughs> um, we have said bitches, bitches and, and hoes too many times tonight. Too um, many times. Oh, and also I've got a new record out. It's called Queer as Folk. I have some copies to flog outside. So uh, I'm going to be with the Waterstones table with the books. If you would like a book, come there. And Grace will be next to me, and we'll sign stuff, uh, sign body parts if you'd prefer that. Um, I, w I wish you would have asked my consent there before you, uh, <laughs> before you lumbered me in Fine. with that. Fine, I will sign body parts, Grace will judge. Um, <laughs> she'll judge your body parts. Left breast better than right. Um, eight out of ten. Slander ten of ten. on my character. That is what's happening right there. Um, Sammy, what would you like to plug? I'll also be stood at that table at the end, and if you could just come and tell me hurtful things about Sean. <laughs> <laughs> that would really nourish my where, soul. Where can we see you or follow you, though? Uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, oh, God. Sammy Tinks, I think. My middle name's Tinkerbell. My initials are STD. Um, <laughs> my dad damaged me in many ways. Um, and I'm on Twitter as Sammy Tinks or Sammy T. Dobson. I should have checked who I am before I okay. came. We'll find you and we can always put so it in sorry. at the end. Okay, great. You're Sammy T. Dobson on Twitter. I've got it right here. Okay. <laughs> Sammy T. Dobson on Twitter. Great. And if you'd like to follow me, I'm at Deborah FW on Twitter. And I am also DF Dubs with a Z on Instagram. I'm trying to post them more things now. I made a film... And it's called Say My Name. And it's like, you know those old screwball comedies where the woman was the powerful heart and she used to go around saying things like, I can run a newspaper as well as you or any man. And I can, I can kiss as well as you or any man. But kiss me, but don't, but do, but don't. It's like that. And um, <laughs> I thought, let's bring that genre back. But it's contemporary. But the woman is the heart of it. She's the surprising one. And she's the one that knows how to get in and out of trouble. And the guy's kind of, you know, trying to navigate his way with her. It's like a one-night stand gone wrong. It's called Say My Name. At the London Independent Film Awards, it just won Best Picture, Best Actor, and Best Actress. <laughs> and it just got into the Liverpool Film Festival and the Cardiff International Film Festival. So I'm very excited. Distributors are coming to look at it. If you would like it to come to a cinema in Newcastle or wherever you are listening to this, if you hashtag say my name movie and say, hey, we'd like the sound of this movie and we'd love to come here to Newcastle. It was written by me and I also have a cameo in it. 
Um, and it was picked up by a female producer who was like doing a Reese Witherspoon and was sick of like the roles. She said, I was playing moms and victims. Mm. And she was like, fuck this. I'm going to do like an independent version of what Reese Witherspoon's doing. And so she's also starring in it. And she's great. Absolutely great. And I've just seen the final edit. I'm really excited about it. Um, also, Channel 4 asked me to make a satirical late night pilot for a TV show called Next Week's News. And the idea of that is if we don't like this week's news, let's change it in time for next week's news. So we did a piece in the pilot about the nursing crisis and we had an idea for how we could uh, fix it with the viewers. They haven't given us a date for the series yet and people keep asking me about it. If you would like to see it, at Channel 4 on Twitter and say, when will we see? Hashtag next week's news. And they will more likely put it on the television if you ask them and they know there's an audience for it. Thank you so much. Can I just say you've been one of the best audiences we've ever had. I just love you and I would play this audience every night. Seriously. I would play this house every night. So thank you for coming out. Thank you for supporting the Guilty Feminist Live. It's traditional that anybody who can and wants to stands for I Will Survive, because this is our feminist church anthem. It's like a hymn. Dancing's encouraged. Well, I just find people want to, and then they feel they can't, because no one wants to start it, because we're British. You guys are gonna help me out this, right? First I was afraid, I was petrified. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. And I spent oh so many nights just thinking how you did me wrong, and I grew strong. And I learned how to get along and now from outer space I just walked in to find you here With that sad look upon your face I should have changed that stupid lock I should have made you leave your key If I'd have known for just one second You'd be back above me Go now, go Walk out the door Just turn around now Cause you're no welcome anymore Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me with goodbye? Did you think I'd grumble? Did you think I'd lay down and die? Oh no, that I, I will survive For as long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive I've got all my life to live And I've got all my love to give And I'll survive I will survive It took all the strength I had not to fall apart Trying to mend the little pieces of my broken heart And I spent oh so many nights Feeling sorry for myself I used to cry But now I hold my head up high And you see me Somebody new I'm not that chained up little person Still in love with you And so you felt like dropping in And just expect me to be free Now I'm saving all my for someone who's loving me Go now, go Walk out the door Just turn around now Cause you're not welcome anymore Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me with goodbye? Did you think I'd crumble? Did you think I'd lay down and die? Oh no, not I I will survive For as long as I know how to love I know I'll stay alive I've got all my to live and I've got all my love to give and I'll survive I will survive hey. now there's an eight minute instrumental bit on the track so what have you got Newcastle I think we should just go for one more chorus what do you think oh no 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 I will survive as long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive. I've got all my love to live, and I've got all my love to give, and I'll survive. I will survive.
I've been listening to the Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Grace Petrie, and our very special guest, Sammy Dobson. The recording engineer was Grundy Lizimbra. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Solinsky for the Spots and End Shop. Thanks to Tony and Hannah at PBJ Live and everyone at Northern Stage, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. <laughs> Heard it in Newcastle. <laughs> only the uh, only the back four rows, but uh, that sounds that sounds like a hip hop. Does it? Classic. Okay, you don't get trigger warnings with life, bitches. <laughs> That's. <laughs> I thought you were gonna rhyme. I thought she's gonna oh. go into a piece of hip hop. You don't get trigger warnings with life. You just get trouble. You just get strife. <laughs> yeah, when things get dull, when things get boring, no one's gonna give you a content warning. It's not, it's not when you'd need a content warning, but I went for it and people got applauded. <laughs> no, it didn't make a lot of sense. And that's an example. I think of... that should always be the content warning. Every, you should use it every episode. A little sound <laughs> clip. I want, it, I, I want it as my ringtone. I think. <laughs>